So good morning everybody and welcome to our latest investment panel event. My name is Mike Deverell and I'm partner and investment manager here at Equilibrium. And I'm delighted to be joined today by Hugh Gimber, who is global market strategist for JP Morgan, and by Nick Wood, who is client services director with Bailey Gifford. And Nick works very closely with the team on the American fund that we hold in our Equilibrium portfolios. So uh, thank you both so much for joining us today. Really, really appreciate you giving up your time. I know how busy you both are, so you know, it's really, really appreciated. So this morning, we've got about 45 minutes for the uh, main part of the event, and there's five key areas that I want to go through. So it's gonna be pretty fast paced. The key areas that I want to discuss are Trump versus Biden. Of course, we've got an election coming up in the US uh, later this year. And at the moment, Joe Biden seems to be well ahead in the polls. So it'd be interesting to see your thoughts on who's going to win and what impact that could have on markets and investments generally. Then I want to talk about China versus America, the trade war, and that kind of seems to have escalated recently. You know, how bad could it get and what impact could that have on companies and, and stocks in general? Then I want to talk about uh, tech and Tesla. Technology stocks are doing extremely well, you know, with real driven by changing in, changes in trends at the moment. So I'd love to get your views on, on whether that's going to continue or whether it's time to take profits. And also I want to ask just what is going on with Tesla's share price, which has gone absolutely ballistic so far this year. Then I want to move back over to this side of the Atlantic and spend a little bit of time talking about Brexit. Not something we've been talking about very much at all recently, given other events, but what outcome of the trade negotiations might there be? And again, what impact that might have. And then I also want to look at world stock markets in general. We've had a phenomenal bounce from the lows in March. So again, has that been surprising and, and, and where do we go from here? So all that should take just under three quarters of an hour. Um, and then we'll be taking your questions. So at the end, I'll be joined by my colleague, Ben Rogers, and he'll be moderating the questions. If you do want to ask a question to any of our panelists, then you can do that at any time during the presentation by pressing the Q&A button on your screens. So we only have kind of about eight minutes for each section. So as I say, it needs to be pretty fast paced. So please, uh, Hugh and Nick, would you mind sort of trying to keep your answers to no more than sort of three or four minutes each time? If need be, what I'm gonna do to spur you on is do this as my high tech kind of dinger to, uh, to get things moving, but I'm sure we won't need that. So, um, okay, the first topic for today is uh, Trump versus Biden. Um, as I said, Biden seems to have taken a real lead in the polls, and frankly, if Trump is no longer in the White House, I personally won't be shedding a tear. Um, but it'd be interesting to see, get your views on, on what effect that might have. Has Trump Biden got it in the bag? And what impact might that have on the US economy? Might he be looking to put taxes up, for example? And therefore, what impact might that have on the US stock market? Um, so Hugh, can I ask you to go first? It'd be interesting to hear your views. Of course, thanks Mike for having me. I'll, I'll do my best not to get dinged by your water glass over the next <laughs> 30 to 40 minutes. So Trump versus Biden. Um, when I look at the data, I think that Biden is clearly in a very strong position. And if the election was to happen tomorrow, you'd have to say that the Democrats would be running into this with very, very good momentum behind them. Has he got in the, it in the bag? Absolutely not. We're still a few months away. I still think that there are plenty of twists and turns to this race. So I'm by no means wanting to get too pigeonholed into one view or another. But all of the data that we look at, not just at a national level, but also at a state level, where if you pick out some of the most important swing states, Biden's also doing very well there. It creates a picture of the Democrats in a very healthy position so far. In terms of what this means for the macro and for the market, there are, I guess, three main areas that I'm tracking most in terms of policy. So the first, as you've mentioned, is around US-China. And for me there, I think it's broadly understood that the direction of that is going to be quite similar, regardless of whether it's President Trump or whether it's Joe Biden in the White House come November. We can come on to that in a bit more detail, but from the market's perspective, 
I think they see little change in direction, but perhaps a more predictable approach, at least, from a Democrat White House versus a Republican White House. Then I think the other big area is around regulation and what the Democrats would be proposing to do in terms of breaking up big tech and breaking up big corporations. And there again, I think you can make a similar point that the direction of travel on regulation for these mega cap names is pretty similar under a Democrat or a Republican White House. The approach again might be different. You might see more use of executive orders from President Trump. You might see a more court-based approach from Joe Biden. But again, I don't think that's new news. The difference is around corporate taxes where the Democrats clearly do want to take a different approach. Biden is proposing to increase corporate taxes from 21% today to 28%, reversing half of the cut that Donald Trump put in place at the end of 2017. And so there, I think it is a, a different stance for corporate America. So in sum for me, Biden in very good shape, but I'm not gonna sit here in August and say that he's got this wrapped up. Tech and US China, the direction of travel looks similar, but with a more predictable approach from the Democrats and therefore perhaps easier for the market. Whereas on corporate taxes, I do think that the uh, Republican stance is a bit more market friendly. And so I really see those two factors netting each other off. And therefore I don't see the election as a strong driver of a regional view of say US versus Europe in the second half of the year. Okay, that's really interesting. Thanks, Hugh. So just, just as a quick follow up to you, Hugh, first, just, you know, you mentioned the potential for tax increases. Do you think that's something they would be looking to do in the near term, given where the kind of the economy is now, or, or would they be more likely to, to hold off? And, and then as a sort of secondary point, there's also talk about whether they might look at a specific, you know, digital sales tax, digital service tax, or something uh, that other countries are looking at that might, you know, particularly be, be aimed at those big tech stocks that, that don't necessarily pay a great deal of tax in the first place. So sure. interesting to get your views on that. Uh, of course. On corporate taxes, I think it's really going to depend on the health of the US economy when whoever wins takes over in January. So if we assume that the Democrats win in November and Joe Biden picks up a US economy that's in very fragile shape, then I think he's going to find it hard to justify hiking corporate taxes straight away. So perhaps that becomes more of a 2022 or a 2023 point for him, but it is a core part of his agenda. So I think that we would have to assume that he would look to get that done at some point. Obviously, of course, on that as well, the makeup of Congress will be important mm. because in order for the Democrats to make big tax changes, they'd need to control both the House and the Senate. So that will be another factor to watch. And then in terms of digital services tax, at the moment, that's more of a European story for me because I think it's primarily the UK and continental European regulators that feel like those big American tech names aren't perhaps paying their way. But I don't rule out, again, the direction of travel on both regulation and taxation for big American corporates looks to be getting tougher rather than easier from here. Yeah, thank you for that. That's really interesting. So Nick, if I could bring you in here. So um, obviously, you know, Bailey Gifford are much more you know, bottom up stock pickers. But some of this stuff that uh, Hugh has been talking about could well have an impact on, on um, some of the, the stocks that you hold in the portfolio. So do you have any thoughts on that? And do you think the market or, or, or even Bailey Gifford as a whole has a, has a preferred candidate? Would they actually prefer Donald Trump to remain in charge, for example? <laughs> Um, like I guess the the challenge for, for for me here is 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 I'm a New Zealander and talking quickly is somewhat alien to me. So, uh, <laughs> but I'll do my best to stick to the the, the three or four minutes. Um, yeah, you, you you're right to point out that what we're trying to do at Bailey Gifford in in the U.S. equity strategy is to invest in four, 40 or so companies with unique uh, cultures, very large addressable markets and sustainable competitive advantages. So what we're really trying to do is find 40 exceptional growth companies that will do well regardless of, of who's in the White House. So we spend far more time, in fact, all of our time nearly, um, analyzing individual companies and getting to know management and, and what really might be important at a company and technological level over the next five to 10 years. We're not, we aren't, of course, completely immune from, from politics or, or macroeconomics. Um, but I, I share quite a lot of 
Hugh's views there. You know, while personally, um, I would prefer anybody um, other than Trump is, is in the White House. Um, that, is, that is quite clearly a, a personal opinion. Um, you know, yes, I, I think if you talk about the, you know, similar to Hugh, if you talk about the direction of um, relations between US and China, you might think there's a similar approach, although I'm sure the rhetoric from Biden would be a lot more measured. Um, you know, on taxes, you know, Biden has clearly said he's going to, he would aim to raise four trillion in taxes over, over the next 10 years. And, you know, a large part of that is, is rolling back tax reductions from the Republicans in 2017. And he's also laid out where he wants to spend that. So I think the single biggest thing he's talked about is two trillion on eliminating energy grid uh, carbon by 2035, subsidized health insurance, infrastructure, education, raising the minimum wage. So you get a fairly clear direction as to where he would look to spend that money, which, um, you know, perhaps favors certain industries like renewable energy over oil and gas companies, certain parts of healthcare uh, and education sector should benefit as well. So we wouldn't plan to change the portfolio significantly based on the outcome of the direction. Yeah. Um, but but you, you can see a, you know, who might benefit at the margin. So, um, so some, like, of, some of your stocks within that portfolio then would actually be beneficiaries of some of these uh, areas that, that Biden would be looking to, to, to spend the money, if you like. Yes, at, at the margin. I think, you know, what we're really trying to do is build a strategy that is that is future-proofed, if you like, is leaning heavily in towards the technologies that are really driving progress over, over the next decade. Just just um, quickly to pick up on one of Hugh's points about maybe more, less about taxation and things, more about some of the legislation that Biden might want to bring in place. In fact, either side might want to bring in place aimed at some of those big tech stock, stocks that have a bit of a sort of monopolistic position. I'm thinking within your portfolio, um, Amazon, obviously a big part of it that, that could be perhaps impacted by that. Is, it, is that something that, that you kind of have to take into account when, when you're building your investment case? Or do you think that's quite marginal for, your, for those companies? Yes, it is. I mean, we think the, um, the competitive advantages and the unique cultures are very well entrenched. So, you know, and, and actually, um, for, for all the social ills, you know, coronavirus has perhaps pushed forward progress and change to online ways of doing things, probably by five years in a matter of months, mm. which has been a big beneficiary to a lot, a lot of the names that we're investing in. But yes, the path of regulation is one of the things that we spend a lot of time thinking about, but it's very unpredictable. Um, and actually, even though the regulation hasn't really happened, you can see it having a big impact on some of these businesses, particularly Facebook, for instance, which yeah. you know has been a fantastic holding for us. The regulation hasn't changed, but their reputation has, and they've spent the last you know 18 months trying to get on top of uh, data security issues and what is appropriate on their platform. Um, and that's been a big challenge for us. And we think they're really still struggling with it and haven't made a lot of progress. And, and when a company has to shift from being on the offensive and innovating, which is what we want them to do, to being defensive and protecting their reputation, it is a challenge. So for instance, yeah. for the US equity strategy, we recently sold out of Facebook because of the fear of, not necessarily the fear of regulation, but the, the, the impact on reputation. Yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. Thank you. Thank you both for talking about that. Okay, so let's move on to the uh, second topic we wanted to talk about today. We already mentioned it briefly, which is China versus America. And I think a bit like Brexit, actually, uh, the trade war has been something we've been talking about for the last you know, few years, really, ever since Trump um, got, got into the White House. And it looked like earlier this year that perhaps it might be de-escalating. We saw a phase one trade deal 
um, signed. Um, but now it really feels like it's, it's escalating again. In fact, a lot of people would describe it now, rather than a trade war, it's almost like a new Cold War, if you like, these two kind of great superpowers moving further apart. Um, so, you know, what, where do we end up from here? And what impact could this have on either economy and markets? Because, you know, there's a sense that trade wars tend to be bad for everybody involved. So just what is Trump trying to achieve and where do we see it going? So again, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll turn to Hugh first, first of all. Sure, so I think where do we go? The path from here for me is escalating hostilities. And for several years, really, the US trying to address the balance in their relationship with China. Uh, and so I think if there's one thing that we can predict from this, it's that US-China um, tensions are here to stay and that investors are going to have to deal with them at any one point in time. I would, however, frame what we've seen in the last few months in quite a different light to what we saw for much of 2018 and 2019. Because tariffs have generally been much more problematic for the market than the type of non-tariff escalation that we've seen over the past couple of months. So if I think we've seen um, consulates closing on both sides, We've seen greater restrictions on diplomatic travel, for example. But so far, the administration in the US have refrained from going down the route of tariffs because they know that it's much more harmful for their own economy at a time where they simply can't afford to put an already <coughs> fragile US economy under more pressure. And so from a market perspective over the next few months, I think the market will deal with further what I describe as non-tariff based escalation. I think the market understands that this is a way of both sides sort of saber rattling, trying to show that they're strong to their own voter base, but without wanting to really go down the route of serious macro impacts. I think for the market, if you saw this go back into a tariff world, then you start to see the macro impact coming through. And in the data, we see that showing up primarily in corporate confidence, and then that feeding through into businesses' investment intentions and their willingness to spend. That, for me, has been the clearest way that you can see this coming through in the data over the past couple of years, that businesses have been much more reluctant to spend in a world where um, tariffs are on the agenda uh, and therefore really threatening how you build a, a business model around the world. Uh, so, so please. Hugh, I think it's quite interesting because, you know, it, do you think Trump is actually really serious about this then? Or is it, is it an, election, an electioneering ploy? Um, you know, and has he actually got a point um, at certain, with some of the things that, uh, that China's behaviour has been like? And, 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 and is he doing the right thing, in fact, by, uh, by taking them on? So, yes, I absolutely think he's serious. This has been a core part of his um, strategy really since he started campaigning. Yes, I think it is an election ploy. I think the timing is convenient in that he often knows that when he wants to really sort of drive a change in public opinion, he goes back to the US-China relationship to try and use that as a catalyst. And I think he's probably you know, working with some reasonable grounds in many areas. So we've seen the European Union, uh, the UK, Japan, also raising some concerns about China's relationship with the world from a, a trading perspective. Uh, and so I think it's quite understandable the position that he's taking I don't think many of us would have gone about it in the way that he has. Um, but I think there is, you know, strong support from across the US electorate, not just the Republicans, for a tougher stance on China. Uh, and therefore, I think he continues to ramp this up in the run up to the election, but avoiding those tariffs if he can, because he knows how that would impact the economy and then the stock market as well. Okay, thank you for that. So Nick, turning to you, it'd be interesting to get your views on how this could affect uh, some of the stocks within your portfolio or within the market as a whole. And particularly thinking uh, of those companies who make some of their profits from China, even if they might be American listed, or in fact, probably more significantly, you've got lots of, lots of large companies with supply chains that involve China. So again, I'm, I mean, it has to be a risk that you, you need to take into account when, when stock picking in the US. Yeah, there is. And, and one of the questions you asked at the beginning there is, is what is Trump trying to achieve, you know, and why has the rhetoric and action wrapped up in the, in the past couple of months? So 
you know, the answer to that is fairly obvious. He's trying to win an election um, and he doesn't have the levers he had a year or two ago, which is a strong economy, low unemployment, and some near-term gains from renegotiating trade deals with Mexico and, and Canada and, and, and others. So, so he's very much um, trying, to, trying to win an election. That, that's quite clear. Um, I agree with much of the direction of travel. Whoever's in the White House, um, there will still be a certain level of disagreement and conflict with China. Um, you know, I, I think it's also true to say that this is basically a tech war, not necessarily a trade war. This is about the U.S.'s long-held um, technology hegemony being cha challenged, you know, very strongly challenged by an emerging superpower. So that's what we really think it's about. I don't think it will deteriorate into a full-blown trade war you know, because China is a very important part of, of the U.S. supply chain from, from T-shirts to, to iPhones to televisions. Americans are not going to tolerate the cost of those going up a lot if you cut off China in any meaningful way. And in actual fact, the U.S.'s ability to hurt China at a macroeconomic level is reasonably limited. You have about... 15% of China's growth is driven by export, exports. Of that, about 15% goes to the US. So, you know, the China is, China is pretty self-sufficient. It's growing at a rapid pace due to very strong domestic demand. Um, and, you know, how does this impact the companies that we invest in and where might this get to? I, I think it is significant enough um, that you get a certain level of deglobalization. You have American technology companies being more dominant in their own market and in other economies that are sort of sympathetic, and you get the same in China and Asia. So you, you get slightly stronger regionalization. Um, it's, you know, I don't think a crusade against China is really going to work. And actually, we would rather more open competition, um, both into and out of China and the US because it, it fosters innovation. You know, you talked about regulation and, and these tech companies um, curtailing maybe monopolies in certain areas, but a better outcome would be open competition and, and innovation across yeah. borders as well as within countries. No, absolutely, absolutely. Well, I think that's really interesting, actually, describing it as a you know more of a a tech war than just a trade war. I think that's a that's a really interesting point to make. And of course, that that brings us quite nicely onto uh, subject number three that we want to talk about that we have already touched on, which is uh, we describing as tech and Tesla. So, um, you know, I feel like uh, the coronavirus has really accelerated some trends that were already happening, I think. You know, we've obviously seen a huge increase in online shopping. We're all watching a lot more Netflix and now we're doing presentations via Zoom and all these sorts of things. So you can see we're all using technology a lot more. And it makes absolute sense that, that therefore that, that tech stocks have done really, really well this year. So but my question is really whether that can continue you know how much of those change in trends is permanent how much is temporary um and, and and whether perhaps the stocks have got ahead of themselves and might be starting to look a bit a bit expensive so those are kind of the main things i wanted to discuss i also wanted to ask uh, and we'll come to nick in a moment to ask in particular about tesla so those of you who uh, who tuned into my uh, client briefing last week will know that i said that uh, so far just this year alone tesla's market cap has increased by the equivalent of 27 times the entire market cap of renault or six times uh, general motors or put it another way 1.2 times toyota toyota is now uh, the second biggest car company in the world after tesla so I want to, to, to ask, uh, you know, what's going on here? And actually, is Tesla even really just a car company or is it something else entirely? So and I'll start with you, perhaps, to talk about sort of tech general from the thematic point of view. And then, and then Nick, we'll come back to you with, uh, with, with Tesla and, and your views in general. So, Hugh, uh, any thoughts on that? 
Sure, I'll be delighted to leave Tesla to Nick, but let me try and tackle the tech sector. And I think for me, first, you have to ask, what are we talking about when you think about the tech sector today? Because if you go by the traditional sort of sector definitions, then lots of the companies that we're talking about now don't formally fit within the sort of old school tech sector if you were to follow MSCI or you know, one of the big data providers definitions. So I think when you're asking about the prospects for tech, there's the prospect for the technology sector and there's the prospect for sort of online digital technology based companies. And often there you get to quite a different conclusion. I think, as you say, this recession has been very unusual in that it has differentiated much more between those online digital businesses and your traditional bricks and mortar retailers, for example. Uh, and so I think when you look at the earnings that many of these companies have been able to deliver, the strength in the market has been justified by the fact that they've been able to grow their revenues and grow their earnings much more strongly than many other parts of the global economy. But when I look forward from here, I, I think it is down to really going through the details of every single company that you're looking at, because it becomes very difficult to sort of take a broad brush view on tech. And there are a couple of questions that I'd be looking at. So first of all, how vulnerable is an investment to a small change in consumer preferences? One of the things that we learned from the tech bubble is that if you're too niche and you leave yourself vulnerable to just a tiny tweak in how people plan to spend their money, then you end up being overly exposed. The second is I'd be thinking about, can you grow earnings in multiple states of the world? So are you looking at some of these names which are perhaps extrapolating life in lockdown over many years rather than many quarters? And then the third is about can you justify that the historical drivers of growth that have allowed these companies to expand so quickly have scope to continue? So if you've grown either by acquisition or by growing market share, what are your prospects going forward to continue to do that? Or have you already eaten as much of the pie as you're going to get your hands on? Uh, and therefore the scope to meet pretty lofty earnings expectations ahead starts to look a lot more limited. So that's a bit sitting on the fence, I know, but I do think it's quite a nuanced view from company to company, not just within the tech sector, but from big tech overall. Well, I think there's some really fair points in there. And I think Nick mentioned it earlier as well, that we seem to have seen you know, several years of growth within a very, very short bit period. And in some ways, that's, that's, that's why we've seen the share prices uh, um, go flying as well. And I also think the, the very valid point there that it's not actually about being a technology company, but a great company that uses technology really well, I think is, is absolutely fair. Um, so, so Nick, coming over to you, I say we, we'll come back to sort of the, the wider tech piece, but I can't, I can't, I need to ask you about about Tesla, you know, because Tesla's not an obvious beneficiary, really, of the kind of the, the virus related trends as such. I don't think. Perhaps you can correct me. Uh, it, it's one of the biggest holdings in the American fund. Um, Bailey Giffen. At, Bailey Gifford has backed it from very, very early on. I think it's a, it's a big part of other Bailey Gifford funds. I think it's like 11% of Scottish mortgage or something like that, or it was at some one point. Now, I know, obviously, you, you're looking at those long-term trends. Your idea is you can find those winners that are going to benefit and, and, and almost hold them forever, if you like. You want to tap into genius visionaries, uh, uh, is, is the, the way that I read it. And certainly Elon Musk falls into that category of being quite visionary, even if he's a bit of a sort of Marmite character. So can you just sort of let us know what's the what is the investment case for Tesla and why do you think it's gone so ballistic in the last few months? And is, you know, is there any chance of Bailey Gifford you know, taking profits or, or or is this something you're on board for the long term? Yeah. OK, well, thanks. That's a, <laughs> that's a wonderful introduction. You're doing a, a lot of my work for me, which is, <laughs> which is terrific. So, um, you know, this crisis is to a certain extent unique. Um, but there are parallels that we can draw from previous ones. And one of those is that great structural growth companies get stronger. Um, there's an anti-fragility to them. Um, and that's certainly been the case this time round. Um, you know, companies that deliver their services online, be that uh, Amazon or, or Alphabet, um, have, have done very well. Um, 
but it's it's far broader than it might appear in technology. I think, as you both sort of said, is a is a bit of a misnomer. If you're not looking at data, if you're not thinking about online and digital ways of doing things in almost any industry today, from education to to healthcare uh, to the automobile sector, you seriously risk getting left behind. Um, and and yes. What we are doing is seriously thinking about which changes that have occurred over the past six months do become permanent and to what extent they become permanent. And that refocuses us not on how well we've done over the past six months or 12 months, but how well we believe we can do in future. So what we're looking at for Tesla and any other company that we invest in on your behalf is do we believe this company has a far better chance than average of going up two and a half fold over the next five years? So it's not about what has happened, it's about what might happen in future. And it may appear to many that um, Tesla appeared overnight, um, but its recent success in stock price terms has been five years in the making. You know, they have set about um, turning the auto industry on its head, um, you know, getting electric vehicles produced on scale at a highly competitive cost, and the cost of production keeps coming down. And, you know, in the past, they've made, you know, extremely challenging targets for themselves and not quite delivered, but still done extraordinarily well, they're actually now starting to beat their own targets in terms of getting the Model 3 up to scale, uh, the Model Y in production, the factory in, in uh, Beijing was delivered ahead of schedule. Um, and that's really the reason why they've done so well of late. There may be technical factors as well, but for us, it's really about the fundamentals. You know, we think over the next decade, basically everyone starts driving electric vehicles. Tesla has a 20% growing market share in the EV market. So what we think has happened is the odds of them becoming the dominant automaker in the world have really shortened a, a long way. And you're right, it's not just about auto. This is about the future of mobility. Autonomous taxi fleets are a very real possibility and Tesla are far more likely to achieve that than anybody else. And also it's about energy production. You know, they are a serious player in, in solar energy and storage. And, and really, um, you know, interestingly, the early Model T Fords were electric vehicles. Um, battery technology has been a barrier to a green revolution for 100 years, and it might well be now, 2020, that that solution has really been, you know, if not sold, we're certainly a long way towards it. So I think that's really what's underpinned Tesla's recent mar remarkable performance. Um, and then what really excites us in, in the broader technology sphere is that because of all the things we've already been talking about, we may well be going through the greatest shift in both production and consumption since the Industrial Revolution. And that creates fantastic opportunities for long-term growth investors. Um, so, so really, that, that's what excites us. We think this shift online, data being a source of advantage, perhaps you know, greater than a manufacturing edge ever was, is really just starting. You know, even in an advanced economy like the US, we're only up to 15% e-commerce online. And we just look at that shift going into, into areas like healthcare and education and um, you know, secondhand autos. Um, and we just get really excited about how early this shift is. Really, really interesting. So, you know, Tesla, not just a car company, and these uh, tech stocks are, uh, are here to stay, I think. Um, okay, that's really, really interesting. Okay, let's move on to uh, uh, area number four that we wanted to talk about today, which is our old friend Brexit. I think over the past few years, there's been times where I feel like I've talked about nothing but Brexit. And then over the past few months, I've barely mentioned it at all. There's been other things on our minds. So, 
we are of course in the middle of trade negotiations with the EU so it'd be interesting to hear your views on you know whether we will get a, a trade deal done with them by the end of this year as we've said we we need to do um, and then you know further to that will we also get trade deals it's just as important perhaps to get these trade deals um, with places like America and, and other countries and how damaging would it be if we didn't get those deals in place and on the flip side perhaps if those deals perhaps tend to be turn out to be slightly better than some people expect would we see something of a brexit bounce so again Hugh your global market strategist I'm sure this is something you have to be all over so what's your views on this sure so I mean we came into the year really feeling like the base case was several months of saber rattling up to the point where you reach some sort of fudged conclusion um, in sort of October, November time. And frankly, I think we're now at the point where the sabers are being rattled, but we still see that fudge coming together later in the year. What I would say on that assumption is that the timelines are starting to get a little bit tight because this is not the same as the withdrawal agreement. Uh, this is a really long, complicated legal document to get a free trade agreement in place. And so if I think about the timeline from here until the rest of the year, you have probably until about November to get everything in place because businesses are going to need a good few weeks to get used to the new regulation and understand how they're meant to be working going forward. So if you roll back from that mid-October to November point, Let's say it takes six to eight weeks to get the legals in place because this is a hefty document with lots of disagreement. So that then brings me probably to around the start of September. And therefore, we're looking at August as the key month to get the political agreement done, the sort of handshake form of the deal done, to then allow the lawyers to really kick on through September, October. So from my perspective, the base case remains unchanged throughout this year that you will see a deal done, likely to still have some gaps in, some language that says, for now, we'll agree to stay aligned. And if either party at a later date decides to diverge, then we'll come back and revisit how we deal with that. But we do think that something will get there. But if we're sat here in six weeks time and nothing is moving on the political front, then I think we'd have to start to really reassess that kind of central scenario. So obviously we talked a lot about American stocks today and, and for obvious reasons, but just, you know, just on the UK side of things, do you think, you know, UK assets, particularly stock markets, you know, are perhaps already underperforming partly as a result of this? And, and, and again, then perhaps could we see something of a bounce if we get some sort of resolution? Sure. For me, what's really held back the UK market this year has primarily been the sector composition and the fact that you have much higher weights to some of the most beaten up sectors in this very unusual recession, such as financials and energy. And very little tech, obviously. And, and very little tech, yeah. yeah, if anything. And so, frankly, I'm being quite surprised. I speak to investors a lot, and no one has told me over the past three months that their central scenario is that you don't get a deal done. Everyone is assuming that, oh, we've seen this before, you'll get some sort of fudge. And so I find it hard to say that all of this Brexit uncertainty is really dragging down that hard on UK markets, given how I think broadly consensus it is that we will get something later in the year. And then just to your other points around the prospects for other trade deals. Yes, I think in time we will get there. But if you know two things about trade negotiations, it's that one, they take a very long time. And two, that they involve significant concessions from both sides. Um, and so I think the idea that we run into the start of 2021 with, you know, wide ranging trade relationships around the world is probably quite a rosy scenario at this point, and that it's likely to see a longer period of adjustment. Um, and therefore, that's why I think for the UK politicians in particular, they will see that eventually the need to maintain some form of continuity to get over this December to January gap. Um, is necessary uh, and then perhaps sort of greater divergence comes with time rather than going for the the pure cliff edge approach yeah no interesting so nick I'll, I'll bring you in at this point and obviously your focus is much more on the the american fund 
Um, does Brexit have an impact on, on any of the stocks um, that, that you look after? I mean, or is it a symptom really of this wider sort of deglobalization that we mentioned earlier? Uh, does Bailey Gifford have a, a, a view on how that might affect their UK or global, global funds, for example? Yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't have much impact or, or any impact really at all on the US strategy and, and the companies that we hold. So, you know, from the narrow perspective of, of, of my role, I guess, my interest is, is personal rather than necessarily pro professional. Um, and I wouldn't argue with, um, with, with Hugh's assessment there either um, that, um, you know, the, US, the UK market rather has underperformed a bit because of the composition of its sectors, you know, heavily into oil and gas and, and, and financials hasn't been a particularly happy place to be. So, um, and I wouldn't argue either with the view that, you know, the consensus is we get a basic deal before the end of the year with, with the rest of the, the detail to, to follow. So, um, so no, I, I, it doesn't, even if we think about our UK equity strategy, it doesn't particularly impact what we're investing in there um, because well over two thirds of the earnings for that strategy are X UK as well. Um, and for all the uncertainty, businesses have had four years to prepare for this. So um, we think the outcome is reasonably clear um, and it doesn't particularly have a big impact on what we're investing in. Okay, thank you for that. I appreciate that. Okay, so on to the, uh, the final topic I wanted to discuss today, which is just sort of world stock markets as a whole. You know, just, it's quite astonishing, I think, that uh, just how strong the recovery has been since the lows in, in March. So it'll be interesting to get your views about how surprised you've been about the speed of that recovery. But also, where do we go from here? You know, I'm thinking particularly at the moment we're into the sort of the summer months where you tend to get thin volumes, you know, very few, much less trading going on around certain stocks anyway. And at the same time, we are now starting to see companies uh, release their results for the first time uh, since the virus. I'm thinking Diageo today, for example, um, uh, released their results. It turns out they've sold a lot less um, alcoholic drinks than you might have expected. Um, I thought we might have sold more than usual, but there you go. But of course, they sell into emerging markets, etc. So as you start to get that perhaps reality check, these numbers in black and white, we actually start to see the impact on companies and the economies in the GDP numbers and the thin volumes do we get a bit of volatility over the summer and then you know what do we need in order to see markets take that next leg upwards and and, and that next recovery is there a catalyst we're looking out for again Hugh perhaps you take that one to, to begin with sure so am I surprised by the direction of markets since April probably not because I think the policy support has been absolutely enormous but am I surprised by the pace and the magnitude of the recovery? Absolutely. I don't think if you gave anyone the sort of macro environment that we've had this year and asked them to predict market performance up to this point, I suspect no one would get that right. Um, and so the pace of the recovery has been far quicker than I personally would have expected. In terms of where we go from here, I think if you look at really the main factors that have driven the market higher, the first has been a significant improvement in the economic data that Q2 was far better, or sorry, uh, at least sort of May and June were far better than April, I should say. Um, and I think the pace of that recovery starts to fade. We're looking at quite a stop start economic recovery really from here until the point that you get a widely distributed vaccine in terms of the policy support. I absolutely expect more to come from both governments and from central banks. But I think the bar for them to create new surprises has been moved higher again. So now this narrative that policymakers will do whatever it takes is in every speech that you hear. So I think for policymakers to create new news to drive the market higher looks a bit tougher. The one thing that looks more attractive now than at the end of March is the equity versus bond decision. Mm -hmm. Because when you look at where government bond yields are, UK 10-year gilts offering you 0.1% it really does not look like an attractive proposition whatsoever. So I think, yes, we could see further volatility as the pace of that recovery starts to fade. Um, but I still think that markets have that support, both from policymakers 
and from the fact that you have little choice um, if you're looking for returns elsewhere. And therefore, I think it's a bumpier ride from here, but we'd be staying invested in equity markets, just trying to do it in a slightly more balanced way, a slightly more cautious way. And balance sheet strength is the primary metric that we'd be looking at to do that. So sticking with those companies that have the best financial strength in order that they would be more resilient if we do see a bit more volatility ahead. Okay, thank you for that. You know, I think uh, I think that's a, a fair point. Actually, I think if 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 you'd have told me what had happened, uh, what was going to happen this year, the fact that certain markets are now back to where they were at the start of the year, and in the case of the the Nasdaq, I think it's up something like thirty odd percent because of that big tech. Um, you know, waiting. I'm, I'm, I think it, it is quite surprising. So, um, Nick, what about what about you? Where where do you think markets go from here? And have you been surprised really where where we've come from? I'm actually going to, um, thanks, I'm going to pick up where Hugh left off there, right? exactly what we did in February and March when this hit. You know, we are naturally optimistic as long-term growth investors, but we looked at the portfolio and said, okay, if all these exceptional things that we hope are going to be achieved over the next five years are going to be achieved, companies have to first survive. So the first thing we did is looked at the resilience of the portfolio, the balance sheet, sheet strength, the cash flows in a crisis situation. We got reasonably comfortable for that. And then we started thinking about opportunities. What changes have been brought forward by five years in the last few months and are we positioned well for them? So that's what we did at a portfolio level. So was you know, there anything that you particularly reduced or increased as a result of that exercise? No, we were reasonably comfortable um, with the outcome of that. The portfolio we feel is, is very resilient. The balance sheet strength is there. You know, for all we're investing in site exciting growth companies, there's net cash in the portfolio, about 30% net cash, whereas the debt ratio or debt to equity ratio for the S&P 500 is, is 50 to 60%. So with very few exceptions, we were comfortable that the companies we were investing in would survive almost regardless of how tough the economic environment got and how long large parts of our economies were mothballed. So what we really then set about doing is thinking about frameworks for working out which changes are temporary and which are permanent. Um, you know, and some of the, the things that have really done best for us, um, we're on Zoom now. Uh, the strategy has a holding in Zoom. You know, if you go back to November last year, about 10 million users a day were going on to Zoom. That number's now about 200 million. Um, you know, another really interesting uh, stock that we bought towards the end of last year, a company called Teladoc, um, that does online medical consultations. Almost everybody in the US has the ability to do that. Very few people have done it. You know, that again, we think is a permanent shift. You know, if you can get your medical consultation in the way that we're doing it now, why wouldn't you? Um, so, so those, those things we think are permanent shifts. And, and the way we've actually started thinking about what shifts do become permanent is through this prism of accumulated accidents. You know, things that we all do that are really suboptimal, but there was a reason why we started doing them in the first place and all these networks built up around them to perpetuate them. Well, they've all just been taken away in this environment. You know, the barriers to adoption have just gone because online ways of doing things in many circumstances now are the only way to do things. So that, that's where we've got to at a portfolio level. In, in terms of um, the market, which is what your question really was, yeah, we'd expect ongoing volatility as you get sort of outbreaks in, in the major economies of the world. You'd expect that to create ongoing volatility. Again, just echoing what Hugh said though, there is massive support for US equity valuations or rather global stock market valuations in terms of near un 
unprecedented levels of stimulus. So, you know, incredibly accommodative fiscal policy now as well. Um, and the other point that you made was a very good one, which is the relative valuations of, of bonds and equities. You know, you're even in the US, you're getting a, you know, perhaps three, four percent earnings yield yeah. when the treasury yield is is negative. So you're yeah. being healthily compensated for taking on on equity market risk. So by no means do we think we're in the same sort of bubble territory that we were in in the late 90s. Yeah, so obviously get nothing on cash either. Uh, well, so th thank you both. That, that was fantastic. I really enjoyed that. We've almost, almost stuck to time. We've not done too badly. So um, hopefully now we should have uh, Ben Rogers joining us um, and he will moderate any questions that we've had from uh, you, the audience. So Ben, are you there? Uh, yes, I am here. Uh, unfortunately, the video is not working, but hopefully you can hear me okay. okay. Uh, so at least I won't be crowding out the, uh, the video streams as well. Um, okay. We've had a few questions through from, uh, from participants. If anyone would like to submit a question at this time, um, you can find the Q&A section button at the bottom of your screen. I'm reliably informed that for Apple, it can be found in the top of your screen. Um, so the first question that's come in uh, is from Philip. Um, and I think, Nick, this is probably a good one for you, given you sort of the, the commentary on Tesla. Um, you obviously spoke about Tesla and, and the long-term prospects that you see for it. Um, Philip's asked about the, the, the meteoric rise that we've seen in the short term um, and that this continues to draw sort of a horde of speculative uh, day traders is, is some of the commentary that we've certainly seen. Um, one of the uh, things that I've seen certainly is uh, almost the rise of FOMO, that fear of missing out, uh, and that some commentators have likened it to, to the cryptocurrency bubble a few years ago. Um, do you think that there could be a short-term bubble in the Tesla price as it stands today? Yeah, I, I mean, um, I, I don't doubt that both day traders and, and short sellers getting themselves in trouble on the stock, it, you know, are probably technical reasons for, for some of the increase in, in share price. Um, so could there be a pullback? Of, of course there could be. Um, if we tried to do anything about that, we would be failing you as, as investors in, in, in what Bailey Gifford does. Um, our our real edge is that our investment horizon is five years and longer. Um, so we, we focus on the fundamentals of companies. And for Tesla, um, you know, we can see that company doubling in share price from here or more over the next five years because of the underlying fundamental progress of the business. And that's what we wholly and solely focus on. Um, Nick, so yes, there could be a near-term pullback. We've got no expertise in that. Um, we are long-term investors, not speculators. So we focus on the fundamentals. When a company has gone up as much as Tesla has, we go back and look at the two and a half times case and make sure that is still intact. And if it is, we remain very happy, very comfortable holders. And Nick, I was just going to add, um, I'm, I'm assuming that just through the general management um, in, in an OIC fund structure, you've, you've had to sort of trim it anyway, sort of banking some of those gains, just because otherwise it would be way in excess of the sort of 10% of the, of the fund, which is, is really the limit, isn't it? That's right. We've, we've had to trim it a couple of times back to sort of an 8% position, because otherwise it would have gone through that 10% holding, yes. Oh, so Ben, any, uh, any other questions? Thank you, Nick. Um, so the, the next question came from uh, Ronnie. Um, Ronnie's uh, stated, uh, creative destruction is underway, which uh, for those that don't know is, is where, essentially where the new technology and new processes destroys old businesses. Um, and he says it's well underway, but that's only a good thing if there are businesses to replace those that are lost. Um, where do you see these businesses coming from and how can governments support them? 
But Hugh, Hugh shall we uh, go that, get that one to you uh, uh, to, to begin with? You know, you know, there's obviously going to be lots of companies who perhaps haven't got very efficient business models going out of business at the moment. Um, let's hope there's some businesses there to, to, to replace them. And, uh, you know, what, what will that look like? Of course. So I guess there are a couple of different ways to look at this. I mean, the first is to say that the biggest names in stock market indexes are doing more and more. Uh, and so well, you know, we've touched on this in the conversation so far that your traditional tech names now offer much wider, uh, a much wider scope of services than they have done in the past. And in doing so, I think they're expanding their market share at the expense of some of the smaller players who are finding that they can't compete. So I think, I guess, at the sort of top down level, the bigger getting bigger and the stronger getting stronger. I also think that through this, we've seen governments aware of this and wanting to make more money available to the very, very small end of the market. And so when I look through the UK government's fiscal stimulus packages, for example, this year, you see that they are still trying to ensure that they're making capital available at the very bottom end of the spectrum so that there's not simply a crowding out that leads in uh, sort of complete domination of the biggest players. So I think the government's focus will be on trying to back projects which would otherwise be unable to access financing through capital markets and try and generate growth from the bottom up. But at the same time, it's benefiting the big players because they're simply able to expand into markets where others just can't compete with their scale. Yeah, I guess when you we talked about it earlier that uh, perhaps governments might be looking to support things such as the sort of the green industries, for example, as part of the stimulus. But obviously that, you know, aids that kind of creativeness. And, and Nick, just to maybe a, quickly um, a sort of supplementary point from you, because obviously most of the companies that you invest in are those disruptors. They are the ones sort of who, are, in a way, benefit from that creative destruction. Uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's absolutely right. I think earlier on, I described it as potentially the biggest shift in production and consumption since the Industrial Revolution. If you put that another way, it's it's basically exactly that. Creative disruption is the order of the day, and it's only just beginning. And yes, you know, um, Amazon, Alphabet, Facebook, you know, have massively expanded beyond their initial remit. You know, Amazon is an awful lot more today than a, a, a seller of books, as, as we all know. So they've done incredibly well in terms of their expansion. Um, but there is lots of emerging competition. You know, some of the things that um, Shopify, for instance, is emerging is, is an alternative to uh, Amazon. And it's it's you know one of the two or three largest positions in the portfolio as as well, um, and we see more and more industries shifting to different ways of doing things and really innovative companies coming through. Um, and and as a firm, we are now very heavy investors in unlisted companies as well. You will have seen that through through our investment trusts, particularly Scottish Mortgage. But that is our way of providing significant long-term capital to, uh, to the next generation of innovators. So, so that's our solution, basically, to invest in and support early stage innovation. Um, but different to other private equity investors, when they list and become public companies, we're not looking for an exit. We will continue to back management. Um, so you innovators, public and private, need long-term significant uh, providers of, of capital. And that's one of the roles that, that we're trying to, to fulfill. Um, but, but yes, we're increasingly excited about new industries where we can see new ways of doing things are really starting to take hold. And I, I mentioned a few earlier, education, uh, healthcare, um, being being really exciting fields where there is a lot of emerging innovation. Fantastic. Uh, ben, have we had any other questions come in? Uh, so, yeah, this is actually the, the, the last question that we've had in so far. So if, if any of our viewers would like to submit a question, they can, we've, we've still got a little bit of time. So if you'd like to pop them through. Um, but this is a question from, from Richard. 
um, he asked, he, well, he says, this time last year, we saw the landmark of US passive funds um, surpassing active funds for the first time uh, with the passive approach seemingly starting to pull ahead. Uh, I thought this would be particularly interesting because we've got Nick on the call. Um, how do you see the passive active debate progressing in a post COVID world? Yeah, Nick, let's go, let's go to you to, to begin with. Obviously, Bailey Gifford, you know, big advocates of active management, but you have a particular way of doing it, don't you? Yeah, I, I, it's, it's that long-term investment horizon that I, that I talked about. Um, it, you know, if you're going to charge active management fees, you must be genuinely active. And that means independent thought, do your own research, get to know company management as well as possible by doing fundamental research from as broad a range of sources as possible. You know, that, that is the, the visionaries running companies, but it's competitive suppliers, um, academics have a much more sensible time horizon than the most sell side brokers. So use academics, use industry experts. Um, so it's, it's, active management, but it's a certain brand of active management that focuses on the long-term success of, of businesses. Um, and, you know, the US market is deemed the most efficient in the world. To us, it is really inefficient. You know, the, the US is the innovation capital of the world. It creates more exceptional long-term growth businesses than any other. It's been a really fruitful um, place for us to invest for the past 25 years. Um, if some active managers aren't doing a good job, you know, then they don't deserve their fees. But um, I don't for a second believe that, that the US market or any other markets that we've been talking about, China is another area that we're invested heavily in because of the pace of growth and innovation you know, there are really significant opportunities to add value as long as you go about what you're trying to do in a differentiated, very thoughtful way and stick to what you're good at. Um, you know, I, I, I get the attraction of, of passive. If you just want broad market exposure at the lowest possible cost, fine. But all the things that we've been talking about, creative disruption means large in index incumbents oil and gas would be the one I would highlight most dramatically, are in real trouble. Um, so the index is far from safe. Yeah, no, absolutely. So Hugh, any thoughts on that? Obviously, uh, JP Morgan, you, you have active funds. I think you have some passive funds as well. You invest in both. Do you have any kind of views on those trends? And, you know, will passive really take over, you know, from, from, from active as being the lion's share of investing as we go, go forward? I mean, for me, I see the rise of passive as a real positive for clients because I think it expands what you can invest in at a very low fee and therefore really holds active managers to account. Because historically, you could have managers who had a value tilt or a growth tilt, but now you can do that by investing in a passive fund that tracks a value tilted index or a growth tilted index. Or if you want a sector exposure or a different style exposure, you can get all of that now at, frankly, very low cost and in some very sophisticated ways. And that, for me, means that the opportunity for active managers is absolutely still there, but it means that they're held to account much more because if you're just hugging the benchmark, but with sort of a, a slight tilt in one or two directions, and actually that tilt is something that you always have, then I think for lots of clients, they say, well, what's the point? Why don't I go and get that for 10 basis points somewhere else? Um, and so I don't, for any reason, see passive as sort of a, a negative threat to the industry. I think it's really positive from a client perspective. And it just means that when you do go active, you want to be doing so with a high conviction approach in a manager that you really trust. And our portfolio managers at JP Morgan are, are finding they're saying they have to demonstrate that they can add value, not just over a broad market index, but perhaps over a market index, which is already tilted to their style to really let that active stock selection shine through. Yeah, I think they're, they're, they're both really, really fair points. I think the rise of passive, you know, we invest in both passive and active funds. We would rather have um, a passive fund on one side and a truly active, completely different from the index fund on the other side, rather than one of these 
closet trackers basically which you're you're paying active fees for a for a passive uh, a passive approach in essence so you know i think it's it's very very uh, healthy for the industry it's driving down uh, costs and making people have to justify their their position absolutely so i can completely agree with both of your points there. Uh, ben, have we had any other questions? Uh, we've not, so um, I'd like to say, well, first of all, thank you to, uh, for, on behalf of the viewers, to Nick and Hugh. It's been uh, really interesting to hear your thoughts, and thank you for, for answering the questions that have come through. Yeah, I would like to echo that, really. So, yeah, thank you, Hugh. Thank you, Nick. I really, really appreciate your your contributions. I, for one, have found it fascinating and enjoyable. So I, I've, I've really had a, a great time. So thank you again. Um, and thank you to everyone at home for, for tuning in. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. Um, we will send a recording of this event out in the next uh, few days. So if you did enjoy it, then please do uh, forward that on to your friends or so anyone that you do think uh, might find that interesting. We'd really appreciate if you would spread the word. Um, we're also going to send out uh, feedback forms as we usually do after these events. So please do fill them in. It really does help us to uh, tailor these events and make sure, you know, that, that, that we're providing what you, you, the audience, want as well. And I know most people who, who have tuned in today are existing clients of Equilibrium, but I think there's a, a few people who, who aren't, who, who don't know us very well. And if you do fall that into that category, um, we'd like to give you a call over the next few days uh, just to see how you found things and, uh, and see if there's anything that we can help with either now or in the future, obviously at no obligation whatsoever. So yeah, just wanted to say thank you again to everybody who's been involved. Thank you to everybody for, uh, for tuning in. Um, take care and we'll see you again next time. Thanks a lot.